that we can be an example of what we're going to teach. As I said this morning somewhere, uh, I think Mahat Gandhi uh, said it the best. He said, uh, we need to be that which we want to see others be in society. We got to reflect that, and that makes us witnesses in the world. We are his witness. We are witnesses to Jesus because we will continue to learn of him. And when Paul thought of the depths of what you can learn being in Jesus, he, he almost always had to give a benediction because he would see something that was so powerful in his life. And so we'd be continue learning, learning and sharing. And so he's sharing this with uh, Timothy. But the first thing uh, we got to do here is we are, we're trying to disciple them before they're Christian. Uh, you first got to be born again. Born again. You, 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 you first must come into the knowledge of the fact that you are a sinner. That you're a sinner. Adam messed us up. We are born sinners. I think that's the, one of the first things we need to know is that we are sinners. We have fallen. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is only one way then to get into the kingdom is that the Spirit of God call you to see the depth of your sin and you turn from your sins to the only one who can forgive sin and that is Jesus Christ. No one else can forgive sin but him. And confess our sin, that is hard. That is hard. And if you've got too much religion before you accept Jesus Christ, it's going to be hard for you to come to him. And the rest of your life, I see people that are trying to be Christian, uh, they, are, they are comparing themselves with somebody else. And as they compare themselves to somebody else, it makes them feel better. And it's hard then to get them to see themselves. It takes the Holy Spirit to do that. And then when you see yourself, that's what repentance is all about. Repentance is about sin, the depth of your sin, and seeing that you're, you're in deep trouble and, and that you can't save yourself and that you need outside intervention. And that's what Jesus came to do. That's what he sent the Holy Spirit to do, is to convict us first of sin so that we could come to know. Paul uses himself as an example. So let's go to our, our text here, the first part of the text. Paul is saying here, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Now we know that Paul's conversion is a creative example of what needs to happen to all of us. Paul says that itself, he's going to say in a few minutes in here. He's going to say, he saved me, the wretched of the wretched, to show an example to the rest of the church of the depths of God's forgiven grace. That's what Paul's life is about. That he was, a, he was the original Osama bin Laden. He was a religious Judaizing bigot. And he, he was a murderer. He said that in his passage here, he persecuted the church. They laid down their, their clothes when they stoned the first deacon in the state in, in, in the scripture. They laid down their garments at the apostles' feet. He was the one giving orders there. And so he was a murderer. But God redeemed him on that Damascus road. He didn't redeem him because he was good. There was nothing in him that commanded him to God, that he was an enemy of God. But on that Damascus road, God imparted faith in his life. He was struck down. That's a beautiful scene. Here's this bigot struck down on that Damascus road. Cries out to God after he hears God's voice. 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let me interpret this. Saul, Saul, I love you. I love you. Why you don't love me? Who are you? That's important in coming to Christ. You got to know it's Christ. There is no salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among mankind whereby we must be saved. You got to know where you have placed your faith. I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that. Don't put your faith in something else. You got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And that, that faith is given to you from God. And so he says, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus who love you. I, I can see that and hear that again in Philippians when Paul said, I, that I may know him the way he knew me on that Damascus road. What happened in that ditch where Paul is there, that sinner, crying out to God? He hears the centrality of the gospel. The centrality of the gospel is that I love you. I love you. Yes, John 3.16 is the center of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're going to hear that again this morning or uh, tomorrow morning. The centrality of the gospel. How people know that we are Christian is by our love for each other. I used to tell a story sometime when I talk about growing up in Mississippi. And I tell them what brought me to Christ when my little boy started going to some good news club and started coming home singing songs I'd never heard before because we were in a Christian family. Good news, good news, Christ died for me. Good news, good news, if I believe. Then he sang another song, and I know they didn't sing it in Mississippi. Uh, particularly, he was in a sort of an integrated situation where he was learning this, that uh, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Brown and yellow, black and white, they are all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I was hearing something about God I hadn't heard before. They couldn't do that in Mississippi because they have to bring National Guards out and kill people, their own people, to let another little black boy go to a school down there. You know they wasn't singing that. They wasn't singing that. They had taken the gospel and they had put that gospel of love into their culture in a way that they could hate others. That's contradiction. That ain't, that's an evil thought. The gospel is about God's love for humanity. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so it's on this Damascus road that Paul was called. He, he was called, not only was he called that he was commissioned. It, it's going to become his duty. It's going to become his pleasure. It's, it's going to become his will because he's going to confirm his will to God's will. That's what it really means to be a Christian. If you're serving God for what he's going to give you, that's a misunderstanding of God. You're serving God because what he's already done for you in the redemption. That he's, and you're serving God out of gratitude that's why you got to you got to become conscious of your sin. You got to be con conscious of the fact that God has given you uh, almost everything. He's given you life, and He's given you eternal life. He made all these promises, and He's given you the ability to be forgiven day by day. That you can have your sins forgiven day by day, and so God has provided what you need in this redemptive story. When he saved you. Oh, I like that verse where it says, what can separate us? Now, God didn't save us. What can separate us from the love of God? God saves us so that we can be with him. 
So we got that. And so he calls him here. Paul, fell. in order to be somewhat successful in any venture that you are on, you have to recognize some of the fact that you was created to do this. That God has called you to do this. A, a leader must have a sense of a, a calling from God. That, that, that he's been commissioned from God to carry on this work that God has called him to, or uh, her, uh, to do. And so the first thing here is that we got this calling. He was, he was, he was commissioned. He was called. That becomes our hope. He becomes our hope in, in God. And he says to Timothy, my own son in the faith. Um, now we, he's preparing leaders to lead. He's, he's talking to Timothy to lead. Before you can lead, you must have already been and is being disciple. And it's always assumed then that the father is going to disciple the son and even Paul is going to say that if you are not discipled, you are not a son. For everyone the son calls, he disciples. If you are not discipled, you are illegitimate. And so the idea here is the illustration he's given here, the Timothy. And he's going to say that later on, that Timothy, from the time he heard the apostle Paul preach and accepted Christ then his mother and his grandmother took him and they discipled him and he's going to talk about that later on he's going to appeal back to Timothy on what he has been taught that he is to live that out and then he as he discipled others what I have taught you you commit that to faithful people who shall be able to teach others. And so Christ calls us, all of us, to be involved in this discipleship. And this discipleship not only strengthens the other person, but it strengthens you in terms of your own life. And so the Christian life is a life of discipleship. In life. That's what he's saying here, my own son in the faith. Look what he says now, what he wishes them to Timothy. He says, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace, mercy, and peace. Now, y'all know what grace is. I've already hinted to it. Grace is the most comprehensive of all of the biblical words. It is even more comprehensive than salvation. And salvation means that you have been saved from the past, you've been saved in the present, and you're going to be saved in the future. So salvation is about being saved. But grace is those virtues that God put into you. What happens here, he takes all of God's redemptive words. He puts it into one word, and grace includes all. All those other words like redemption, perseverance, uh, salvation, sanctification, all of those words are put into the word grace. And, and then we are to live out that grace. We are to be gracious. We are to be gracious. But this word grace is a given that you... So you, if you don't understand these other redemptive words like in Galatians 5 like in Peter, uh, all those words, redemption, faith, perseverance, uh, long-suffering. And if you don't understand that, you know, you don't quite understand grace. Because gra all the gifts in the Bible, uh, the gifts that he gives us, the gifts of the Spirit, all of those are called grace, graces, grace. So grace is the big word, and we are to live out that Grace. In my little memorial, I have to my son, Spencer, who, before he died, really began to understand that grace. And he was trying to get us, even as a family, to become more gracious. And it's a little memorial plaque I have in there. 
it says grace is supposed to be our way of life. That's the way we live. We live as gracious people. And so he wants us to be grace and peace. Peace. It, 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 there is this, this peace with God that comes when you receive him as Lord and Savior. You get peace with God. You get that peace of God as you, no, you get this peace with each other as we live out this Christian life. And then we have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And so peace is, is the, it, sort of like the end results of grace having this impact on our life, you know. And so it says, uh, peace and grace. Uh, be unto you. And then he tells why he's writing the, this epistle here. He's writing this epistle to Timothy. It's something you don't hear now. It, it tells us something about what I said at the first, about that we have coined us a self-help religion. We are pretty much doing what is right in our own eyes, and we have a religion of sort of self-elevation. That's the kind of religion we've had. And that's self-idolatry. And the biblical text, the first, one of the first things that God wants you to know, that he's one and there should be no other God before him. And it's easy for us to elevate ourselves up in the place where God needs to be. And Paul was warning people about, he said, I don't preach myself. I don't preach myself, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's who I preach to the world. That's how I preach to the world. And I hear this. A lot of this stuff I hear, a lot of this prosperity, Christianity, is a self-elevation. It, it, it is deified money. It is, it is if I got that, and all of that is put before God. Well, why would you do that? Because all of this stuff belongs to God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. And he said if we be discipled and obey him and seek his kingdom, all the things that we need to seek his kingdom with, he's telling us what to do first and what to put first. Put his will and his kingdom first. And then, and, but we put this other stuff first in our life. And, and so we have, we are almost serving a false and this is why this is the purpose the purpose of this letter here is so that timothy don't preach this self-elevation that timothy don't preach another god that if anyone come paul is going to say to the to the galatians preaching any other gospel in that let them be a curse because that's going to be a false gospel and so he left timothy there that's the purpose of this epistle Keep that in your mind. All, all these other things. Because he have delivered unto them the truth. And now as that church is there in Ephesus, that Timothy is going to be in charge of, he wants Timothy to preach the word, to be instant, in season, out, out of season. Because God's power is released through us by his word. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the Word of God. It is by the Word of God. It is by that obedience to what God has said is that our lives are transformed. And so he don't want that Word all mixed up. He wants God to be the Almighty and that we're to worship him and that we're to put no other God before this God here on earth and we're to glorify him. And we have to glorify this God that lives in the local church. We have to glorify this God who lives in the local church. That's what we got to do, all of us CCDA. We are doing a lot of the good social work, and I want you to keep on doing it, okay? But we got to reestablish ourselves now within the church because it's the local church here that can't be destroyed. He said the gates of hell can't prevail against it. And in China, they did all they could. Mao was doing all he could to take Western influence off of the Chinese people and Western religion. 
but they went on the ground with Jesus. And for those years, it was on the ground. Everybody said the church is dead. And when the bamboo curtain came down, we found 70 or 80 million people in there serving God. And in and, and, and a, and a sly way, I'm hearing that, 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 uh, that, that, that the ideas of the creed, they want a little bit more of the virtues of the Christians because they was disciplined during that time they was on the ground. They had to do something. They had to, they had to work hard to stay faithful. But we got so much freedom that we have reduced our Christianity almost down at least to ourselves. And that's a dead end street. I want everybody to know that. The best news that Jesus could say, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's not abandoning yourself. That's putting yourself in the hands of Jesus who says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gives them to me is greater than all and no one is able to pluck them out. I like that. I like that. I like that. We have a savior, folks. We have a savior. And we need to present him. We're trying to release him in the community. We're trying to unshackle the gospel. We need to remove this colonization and this power of play and begin to walk in humility. Our nation need to hear this. I mean, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. We didn't know the depth of our prejudice until we got Obama. And we're willing now to destroy this, con this country to not let him succeed. It's deep in us. All of us don't think we don't have it. I, I get angry with, with black folks saying, this is a black thing. White folks can't know it. I said, they know more than you do. You buy all your cars and all your food and everything. They tell you what to buy and they own everything. And all the thing we own in our community is these giving birth to these drug dealers and other people who are destroying our own people and killing each other in the community. All that is bigotry. That's bigotry. We got to come back to some authentic Christianity and we got to talk to black folks and white folks. We are damaged. We are damaged. And, and, and boy, being a disciple today is, today is redemptive. I really believe it could redeem our nation. I believe what God said if he said of my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. God said he'd hear us from heaven. He'll forgive our sins and heal our land. I love my grandchildren so much. I would like for them to enjoy some of the fruit of this land. But we're allowing the greedy bigots we're not, to take it over and destroy it. We have outsourced everything. We really gonna really need some of these people that we're gonna outsource this stuff to to come back and civilize us. Wow. We're in trouble. I, I really believe right now the most patriotic thing I can do, the most patriotic thing I can do today is to be a Christian. And, and I'm finding, I'm finding where I come from now and the people sorta listen to me. The governor, lieutenant governor, these people sort of listen because they're in trouble. They are looking for a way out of this. And the little thing they see is they can see that you've been persevering. If you've been doing something a long time, if you've been solid, they will listen to you. This is an exciting day. This is what motivates me. What motivates me, I see you folks everywhere I go. This new generation who's overcoming racism and bigotry, where well, we are coming together to be the people of God, and, and, and who have a bigger concern, have a concern for the environment. Oh, I remember my right-wing Christians in California. They hated the environment. They thought Al Gore was an environmental freak. 
you, you know, they, they, let's, let's do the land the way you want to do it. Let's cut down all the trees. Let's dig up all the oil. Let's do all the, let's pollute everything. And that's all right because that's good free enterprise. This new generation, I like that. This new generation have a feeling for people. This new generation want to touch people. And that's the group of people that I want to see. That's the kind of people that I want to see CTA become. These people who are concerned about everybody. Concerned about the environment. Concern, oh, I like these gardens that we are getting. And we, I got that garden, man, we got some food. We can feed a lot of people in a garden. I mean, it's, this, this is an exciting, let me con get ready to conclude here, get ready. I got 15 more minutes, I'm watching this clock. So let me, let, let, let me, let me keep going in. And so we, get, we got to get, we got to get. So God wants us to have, first thought here, God wants us to have this peace, grace and mercy and peace of God, our Father, and Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, uh, that's total commitment. Paul is saying here he's totally committed to Jesus as Lord of his life. Then he says here, this is what I was teaching. As I taught you, as I besought you, I wanted you to stay on in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, Macedonia, that you might charge them to teach no other doctrine. This is important. False teaching is very serious. You don't hear much about that. There's two things I don't hear about much as I listen. I don't hear nobody saying anything about false teaching anymore. I don't hear anybody saying anything about truth. Truth has become situational. Truth has become what I said I wanted to be. Truth has become what I wanted to be. Truth has become what I said it was. There, there is no biblical truth as we look at it, but there is a truth. There is a truth, and the central truth is in Jesus Christ, and it comes out of his wisdom, his wisdom. So Jesus Christ, he says, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. That's why we got to present uh, Jesus. I want you to be there. Then I want to charge you that they teach no other teaching. Neither give heed to uh, fabulous, endless genealogy. And he said all of that stuff doing is ministering question rather than godly edification, which is in faith, he says, so do. We have to, we have to live by faith. And whatsoever is good, whatsoever is wholesome, whatsoever is a good report, we've got to teach that. Teach that to the Christian. That makes us round. That makes us loving. That makes us concerned. And so he tells them what, what not to teach, but he also tells them here what to teach. Now he's going to watch what he's going to say here in verse 5. He said, now the end of the commandment is love. Is love. Now y'all understand that. That, that, that's what the, the good Samaritan, the guy, the lawyer who asked Jesus, he asked him, what is Christianity, what is religion all about? He asked him the all-inclusive, why should I be a religious person? Why should I follow you? What is the meaning of religion? That was the big question. And he said, the meaning of it, as we understand it, is to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength and all of that. And Jesus said, you got it. All you got to do now is go out and live it. And because the God knew there were some people out there he didn't like, he was a bigot. He didn't like those Samaritans. And when we talk about a good Samaritan, that's a contradiction in thought for a Jew. That, that in their mind, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. And Jesus said, you got to love him too. A good uh, 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 Christian is about love. We could solve some of this racial stuff. All this racial reconciliation stuff we are talking about. If we believe that all human beings was created in the image of God and had inherited dignity, we could get rid of that stuff. And there is no redemption in being a bigot, a racist, a traveler, a uh, bigotry. Ain't no redemption in it. It's an absolute waste. There's nothing good about it. Because the best thing about it is that God made from one blood all races up on earth. He placed them in their inhabitation. 
He placed them there so he could restrain sin in the world. Because what had happened, they had gathered together and they were bringing the world into sin so fast, he had to scatter them at the Tower of Babel so that they could be restrained in the world. But he had appointed a day when he was going to bring a Savior into the world. And that's the Old Testament is about that. Someday, one is going to come who's going to bring war and violence to an end. And he's coming. He came the first time as our Savior and Redeemer. He's coming back again. And there's going to be peace on earth. We're going to beat our uh, uh, guns into plowshares and our weapons into pruning hooks. We're not going to study war anymore. We're going to live in this wonderful world. And we should be looking for him. He that has this hope in him. He that has this hope in him. You, you know. So he's coming back. Okay, let's continue here. It's important. It's important. It's, it's important that we come back to the truth. It's important that we tear down all these walls that are blocking us from God. And all these little gods that we have set up in front of God. And we've got to come back to this true and living God and be free. We've got to come back to that. The other thing, I said two things that, that, that you don't hear. You don't hear much about truth. You don't hear nothing about false God uh, in, in our society. And you don't hear anything at all. One word we have taken out of the, out of the Bible, and it's the word that's getting us into more trouble than we can do anything with, and that word is fornication. We done removed it from the Bible. We have removed it. It represents our greatest medical crisis because AIDS is transferred through fornication. That's the way AIDS is transferred, basically. We don't remove that from the Bible in our society. And, and our problem in our school is these precious children are coming into the world without an intact family. They're coming in without fathers being there to nurture them and churches there to grab them and to surround them. We had another one of my great grand. And what thrilled me so that I was at the hospital all day long. That baby wouldn't come fast enough. Uh, I was there. But my family was there. And my, his, her family was there. And when that little guy came out, it was about 50 of us there ready for him. <laughs> we don't have that no more. We don't have that much anymore. Because see, the boy, the, the, the woman is mad with the girl because the boy knocked up. And the other one is mad with the other one because of not. And so they come in without any extended family. And, and they're on the way. The grandmother wasn't but 35 years old. And there wasn't no grandfather around. And there we got the violence. And there we got 65% of the prison in America come from my ghetto. Come from this place where there is not this nurture. And the church is not doing that nurture. We are there. Christian community, we said Christian community development that don't have a youth component is not legitimate. It's not legitimate. If you are not within whatever program you got, if you don't have a discipleship program, if you don't have a program of shaping young people to take over and to serve the community, you are not legitimate. You are just doing something that's expedient for you and your generation. But you are not doing it for the generation. We're supposed to be building generation, generation, generation. Let me, so this, that's, so he tells us here, look what he says now. The end, the end of everything is charity. Out of a pure heart, out of a pure heart. This is another thing today. I listen to people, they just lie, 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 lie. This is the lionest group I ever seen. Uh, they won't be true to each other. And, and they won't be true to each other. And I, I find this all the time. Uh, people listen to me and they listen to what I want them to say. And they say what I want them to say. And then I usually know that they are lying to me. So it, it's hard today. 
It's hard to work, live in this crooked and lying world where people are not honest. People are not honest. Integrity is hard to find. Let's continue. He says this here. Look what he says here. Out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a good conscience with the have and with the have abiding faith. And he says from which some have turn away. Look what he says here in verse 6. Some have turned away from this faith and turned to just talk, jingling, and desire, they desire to be teachers of the law and understand neither what they're saying and neither what they're talking about. Then he gives this affirmation here. But we know, verse 8, but we know that the law is good. He's talking about the law is good if a man use it lawfully knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous people, but for the lawless, for the disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, for the profane people, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, uh, for men uh, slaughters and for uh, homongers. He says it here again. That is so important. Life is so precious. And we as fathers and mothers have the responsibility and the privilege of nurturing life and to bring in life into the world. And that life needs to be so nurtured. That's what the church is about. Uh, the, the, the biblical story is modeled after the family. That's why the Bible is about family. And to the extent of family, and that's what co Christian community development was. The Christian community development, no the problem. What is the problem? The society is broken. We have broken relationship with God. We have broken relationship with each other. Uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a broken families and we have broken communities. And so Christian community development is restoring that which is broken and creating a community of nurture where we nurture each other we got to care for each other we got to love each other and we got to be tender with each other and especially with our children here and so he says now uh, he, 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 get, he gives us that uh, then what he's going to do here now as we go along here he, he talks about these kind of uh, people in verse 11 according to the glorious God oh I got to go back here he says here for man stealers and for liars and for prejudiced person there is any other thing he wraps it all up that is contrary to sound teaching uh, and he said according to the glorious gospel uh, of our blessed lord and savior jesus christ and 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 so that's the first introduction paul have and now he comes to verse 12 and we just get into that slightly and we'll close here uh, then he says and I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, put me into the ministry. And now he talks about who he was, and we'll close with that. He said, before I was a blasphemer, a blasphemer. He fought against the church. He didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in no parts of God. To blaspheme is to not to believe in the work of God through the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to blaspheme, you know. It's a, it, and so he said, I was a blasphemer before I was converted, but he enabled me. He put me into the gospel. And he said, I was a persecutor. And this word injury here means that I was a bad man. I did everything you could think of, including killing people. He said, I was a bad person, Paul said here. But I obtained mercy, he said, because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. I don't care what you've done in the past. God, redemption is available to you. It's available for, to you. I, you know, I, I feel sorry for people when they execute people. I'm not saying, well, you shouldn't execute people. I'm not saying that. But I feel sorry for the people who go there rejoicing. Go there rejoicing. I feel sad for them. And I know you, when you lose your loved one, I know it hurts you. <laughs> But the God has no pleasure in the death of anyone. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to it.
to to repent. I'm not making a I'm not making a to do I believe in the death penalty. I, that ain't what I'm doing. I'm saying we ought to have an appreciation of life. That's what I'm saying. And we want to because I think if you're too careless that way, you'll be careless other ways. So we got to be care, we got to be careful uh, here with life. Let me conclude here for today. Uh, I talked for today. He said here. Uh, he said he did it ignorant. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was abundant towards me, exceedingly great towards me. And that faith and what got me was his love, how much he loved me. I'm going to stop there. Look, a gospel without love is no gospel. Love. If we see our brothers and sisters destitute of daily food, and don't give them those things that are needed for the body, how dwell the love of God in us? And he contrasts that with hatred. There is no redemptive element in hatred. He said, hate is not of God, but love is of God. He that loves knoweth God. He that hateth knoweth not God, because God is love. Boy, we have a good news, don't we? We have good news that we can share with our nation. Well, tomorrow morning, let's get, we'll, we'll probably get to chapter two uh, tomorrow morning, but we want to have this kind of, we want to have this kind of discussion. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you, Lord, that we could be here this morning, this room full of people. Lord, I pray that you would empower us, that you would help us to take these few days to learn. And this is just the beginning. That we would go back to our community and we would be your disciples. That people would know that we are Christians because of the love we have one for another. So bless us.